Hi everyone, my name is Paul Ambrosiusen. I'm a technical artist focused on Houdini and real time. Um, I work at a company called Bismuth Consultancy doing freelance work. Uh, in the past, I've worked at SideFX where I was the lead for SideFX Labs. And in this session for the Everything Procedural Conference 2023, we will be talking about various things. We'll be covering uh, how to create plugins. We'll be talking about starting a GitHub repository for your Houdini work as well as creating custom Python modules, extending menus in Houdini, installing external Python modules, and integrating ChatGPT for VEX all the way at the end. So that is the end result that we'll be working towards. All right, let's get started with plugin packages. Plugin packages. So to begin with, what are plugin packages? So you may think this is a new concept, perhaps not, perhaps you've used them lots of times already, but essentially packages are collections of HDA scripts, shelves, up customized files, desktops, Python panels, environment variables, and lots more. You've probably used a variety of these already um, in Houdini, for example, SideFX Labs or Mops or MLOps, or perhaps you've used Kinefx, because Kinefx is also a plugin that Houdini itself ships uh, which you can find online. So let's take a look at one of these packages. And the one that I'm going to be looking at is the uh, SideFX Labs one, which you can find on the GitHub. And as you can see here, when we go to the GitHub repository for SideFX Labs, we can see that it has lots of folders and files in it. It has a desktop folder, uh, a miscellaneous, an OTLs folder, Python panels, scripts, toolbars, uh, viewer states, and then it has a bunch of other stuff here as well, such as up customize, up menu XML, Parm menu XML, and lots more. So these are all files that together make a plugin package. These are what gets loaded into Houdini. And what's interesting is if we go into the install directory for uh, Houdini itself, right? So where you've installed Houdini. Uh, and then if you look at it on Windows, uh, it'll be in this location, most likely program file, side effects software, then the build, and then I'm going into the Houdini folder. You'll actually see that these folders that we saw before, such as the Python panels or the viewer handles, the viewer states, those XML files that I was showing before in the side effects labs repo, these are also actually just Houdini's own files. So the way you can think of uh, plugins and packages in Houdini is that Houdini itself is just one big deck of cards. A plugin is just a set of cards that a user has created. And what will happen when Houdini loads these plugins is it will basically just put these new cards, right, the plugin, into the deck of cards that is Houdini, which then together make up what you get to work with as an environment in Houdini. So that's pretty great. It's a, it's a fairly easy to work with concept and uh, really nice for you, for any user, to create packages that you can deploy to users you know, in your studio, across people on the internet, and uh, whatever else you want to do. So now that we know what a package is, how can we actually create a package like this? Now, creating a package and loading it in Houdini is actually fairly straightforward. This is done using JSON files that you can point at simply a uh, directory on disk that has these files in it. The most straightforward and the minimum amount of code, uh, or not really code, but uh, contents that your JSON needs to have to have to load a package is these three lines. We have these curly braces uh, opening and closing it, right? Typical JSON format. Then what we do is we define a key, right? Which is called HPath. Then we put a colon and then between quotes, we just point it to the path on disk that is where the plugin is located. So for me, that will be on the H drive, then GitHub, and then you can see I have lots of packages here. And then I have a copy of SideFX Labs with my own modifications called SideFX Labs underscore Paul. And as you can see, this is all these files that we saw before on the SideFX Labs repo, as well as in the install directory for Houdini itself. So this text that we have here pointing to this folder uh, structure, is basically just telling Houdini, hey, I'd like you to load these cards and shuffle them into the deck that together makes what you use Houdini with, right? Now, that is the absolute minimum um, requirement for loading a package. You can, of course, do lots more with packages. You can do conditional loading, you can construct environment variables, you can define what version the plugin is for, you can enable and disable packages and lots more, 
all with other keys that Houdini knows about when loading packages. You can see here, for example, that instead of loading the plugin directly, what you can also do is you can tell Houdini that, hey, I'm going to be defining some environment variables, in this case, an environment variable called side effects labs, all in um, uppercase uh, letters, and then just point it to that same folder. And then instead of uh, setting each path to be this path directly, we can just set it to be this environment variable. And this is really convenient because now all throughout Houdini, you can just tell it to um, use side effects labs, you know, dollar sign side effects labs, you've probably used dollar sign variables before, and it will know that you're pointing to this directory here. Okay, so that's really great. Let's try and um, do that ourselves real quick. Now, I'm not going to be creating a new package. What I will do, however, is um, construct some environment variables. Okay, so what I'm going to be doing first is boot up Sublime and uh, make a new file, which I have here, okay? And we're going to do exactly as was shown here on this page before. So we have these two curly uh, brackets, opening and closing it. Then we're going to construct a key, which we're going to be calling environment. Now, and this one is a little bit different because environment uh, is going to be a list, right? A list means that it's basically just a series of things. As you can see, I've defined multiple here, okay? So what I want to do in here in environment is define those environment variables. Now to do that, once again, another set of uh, curly brackets like that. And then within it, we're going to create another key. So we're going to say, uh, let's call this test underscore key underscore zero one. Then we're going to put a colon and then we can just put anything that we want here, right? We can just put some words, we can put numbers, we can put whatever it is that we want. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to write hello, this is a test, exclamation mark. Okay, really great. Now let's try and define another one. So I'm going to add a comma here and then once again have a set of uh, curly braces like that. Let's create another environment variable, for example, test underscore key underscore zero two and then another colon and then let's add quotes because we're adding a string or actually let's, let's set this to be a number instead. So let's just do the number seven, there you go. And then what I'm going to do is first boot up Houdini because I want to show you that these environment variables that I'm defining here currently are not part of Houdini, right? It has not seen these yet. Okay, we can just ignore that because I disabled some plugins for the purposes of this video. And the way we can check on environment variables in Houdini is either create a node and in a parameter type dollar sign and then the name of the environment variable, or we can click on about Houdini, click on show details, and then we can just simply scroll down all the way to the bottom and we can find all our environment variables right here. We can even see which uh, packages are currently loaded and we can see that deadline is currently loaded. We can see that Apex is loaded. We can see Kinefx is loaded. And we can also see that it is trying to load something called package dears, um, which I'm not covering in this video, but you can read about it in the documentation. Now we can see, for example, that we have this environment variable called HFS, and this is simply pointing to the install directory of Houdini itself. Now we can, we can see that the key that we just defined, the test key 01 is not defined, right? It does not exist here. So I'm going to be closing Houdini and I'm going to be saving this file, save as, right? I'm going to be saving this in my Houdini preferences uh, directory, which for Windows is going to be in your documents, Houdini 19.5, and then a folder called packages. Now in here, we can create a name of our package. For example, I'm going to be calling it uh, epc underscore zero one dot JSON, like that. And then simply save it, okay? So now that we've defined this, we can boot up Houdini again, and we should now be able to see these environment variables be present in our Houdini environment. Okay, I'm just going to copy this real quick because I want to showcase something. And now let's go back to help about Houdini, show details, and then scroll down to the bottom to the letter T. And then we can see indeed that we have defined test key 01 
as well as task key 02. So this is a really convenient way to create environment variables. And I should say the preferred way of creating environment variables, unless of course you have a studio and you're using custom workflows, you should no longer be using the houdini.env file to load packages, to create environment variables and uh, other such things. Now, the other thing, of course, the other reason, um, the other method you can use to um, check if your environment variable is present is, of course, using the dollar sign um, terminology or syntax. So, for example, just put it like that. And then we can see that this is coloring yellow, indicating that it is there. And then when we expand it using the middle mouse button clicking on it, we can see that indeed it is properly evaluating to be what we want it to be. Now, let's try the other one. And we can see that one evaluates to seven. Great, you've now learned how you can create a package, right? Just create a folder structure with uh, files in it, similar to this, right? You can create a JSON with this text in it, right? The H path at the very least, or create an environment variable to load it. And we will now have our package loaded. Now, to finish off this video, what I'm going to do, however, is uh, create a package myself. So I'm going in here, I'm just going to create a new folder real quick. Um, and I will be calling this folder um, EPC underscore zero one. Let's create that. And then I'm going to be creating that environment variable, right, the H path that we saw before, uh, right here. Let's add a new environment variable. And then this one here, I am going to be calling um, EPC underscore zero one. And then what do we set that value to? We're going to set that value to be the path of where our plugin is located, okay? Now, of course, the other thing that we need to do is have Houdini loaded. So we're going to say H path colon, and then we are simply going to set its value to be dollar sign EPC underscore zero one add a comma there, otherwise Houdini will not like it. And then now what we've seen is that we've created an environment variable called EPC01, pointing to this folder, as well as adding it to our H path, which is going to be the location that Houdini loads the package for. Let's verify that here, and we indeed can see this is correct. Great. All right, now let's boot up Houdini again and verify that our package is properly loaded. So let's close that. Uh, because it is important to note that packages will not refresh in Houdini unless you restart Houdini. If you use the launcher to boot Houdini, I would also recommend closing the launcher and reopening the launcher whenever you make changes to your environment. Okay, now let's verify our package is loaded. Let's go here about and let's scroll down to the section that says um, loaded packages. And we can indeed see that now our bc01.json is loaded as well as our environment variables we defined. So we should now be able to properly load these uh, whenever we add files to it. Okay, that is it for plugin packages. The next thing we're gonna be doing is starting a GitHub so that we can actually uh, upload our files to GitHub and distribute them to other users. All right, moving on to the next chapter, which is starting a GitHub. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be creating a repository on GitHub which will allow us to upload our files to the internet. Now, GitHub, you can think of something like perhaps Google Drive or Dropbox, which is just an online way of storing your stuff on the cloud. Now, um, GitHub is really great because it allows us to either upload our files for free, right, with the public method, but it also allows us to upload our files for free as a private repository, meaning that only people that you've given access to the repository is able to find um, your files and download your files. But what does the word repository actually means? It's simply a place online where all of your data lives. Think of it as the online copy of your files that you have offline, okay? Because you'll have files locally, right? But you'll also have files online on GitHub. And these may not be in sync. And we're gonna be looking at a couple of new concepts um, in order for you to properly manage what is uh, part of your offline copy, right? Your local copy, and what is part of your online copy, which is the repository. Okay, so the very first thing that we're gonna be doing is going to GitHub. 
And on GitHub, uh, I want you to create an account if you don't have one yet. And then you'll be represented with a page similar to this. Uh, perhaps it's a little bit different because I am subscribed to some people and have some repositories already, but you'll probably find this green button here that says new. So I'd like you to click that and then um, use it to create a new repository. Now we're going to be creating a repository called EPC underscore zero one, and we're going to give it a description. We're going to say, uh, this is a repo made for the EPC workshop like that. Now we can decide if that uh, repository should be public, meaning anyone on the internet can see the repository, um, but only people that you know we specify, that the creator can specify who is allowed to add files to it. Or we can make it private, which is uh, only people that you've given access can see and download the files, but also only people that you've given access can write to it. Okay, so that's a little distinction between public and private. Uh, it is important to note that you can change this after you've created it. So I'm going to go with private first. I'm also going to be creating a readme file and a, um, a git ignore file, which for some reason goes off screen. Um, okay, so then we won't create a git ignore file, we'll just create it manually. And then we're going to click create repository. Okay. So there you go, it has now created it and we now have our repository online, which is awesome. So how do we actually work with this repository? Because now we have an online copy of our project or where our project is going to be, but how do we actually tell it where our files live locally? Now that's what we're gonna be using the GitHub client for. Now, depending on uh, your skills and your um, experience with GitHub, you may either use the terminal to do all this work uh, you may use some other client to do it, but I like using the GitHub desktop. So I'm going to be clicking this button here that says open with GitHub desktop. Uh, and since I've already installed GitHub desktop, I can just click the open button here. Now, then what I can do is uh, in this uh, pop-up, it automatically fills out the link to our repository, but we also need to specify a local path. And this local path is going to be where our repository lives. So in this case, for me, it's going to be this EPC01 folder that I created earlier, okay? So just like that, HEPC01. And remember, this matches that JSON that we created earlier, right? Where we said that EPC01 equals this folder here. So our package, our plugin, is going to be stored in this folder, which is also what GitHub is going to be working with. This means that when we make changes on GitHub, when we push them to GitHub, when we pull new changes from GitHub, this automatically gets reflected in our Houdini environment as well. So let's clone that real quick. Now you may get an error uh, saying that it needs to be an empty folder. And the reason for that is as the error will say, you need to have an empty folder. So if you don't have an empty folder, first clean your folder, make it empty, move your file somewhere else then clone your repo and then just move your files back into this folder and you should be good to go. Okay, so now that we have our files locally, we can try adding some files to it, okay? So let's see, we've made these changes here already. So the first thing that I'm going to be doing, uh, which I always like doing, is put the JSON, right, that we've created and just put it in the root of your repository. And the reason I do that, or like doing that, is so that when people download the repository, right, the, uh, the plugin that you've created, they can just simply copy this JSON. They can modify the, um, oh, I can see that I did not actually save this file properly. So let's go back here. Let's save that and copy the correct version. Let's see, yes, that is the correct version. Let's copy that one. Just overwrite it here. So when people actually clone your repo or your plugin, they will automatically just have a copy of your environment uh, variables that you define. Because perhaps your plugin has some of these environment variables that we see here, which it requires inside of the plugin itself. So it's just a little bit of a convenience for users uh, on the internet. Okay, so now that we have this file here on this folder, um, we can go back to our GitHub repo and just hit refresh. 
And what we'll notice is that um, we don't have that JSON here, but we did add it to the folder. Now this is a nice thing about working with version control because as we can see, we need to be explicit about what we add to our um, repository. So when we go back to our GitHub client, we can now see that it has added this little thing here with a little plus next to it, which says new. And as we can see, it has outlined in green here, all of the new stuff that we have locally, which is not present on the online copy of our repository. So what I'm going to be doing is uh, create a description here real quick. So I'm going to say uh, create EPC um, JSON and then simply click commit to main. Now, in this case, it says uh, author identity unknown. It does not know who I am. So there's an error that I'm going to be fixing real quick by going to repository, repository settings. And then um, for this repository, I'm just going to be using my own name. And for the email, I'm going to be using my own email. So I'm just gonna hit save there. And then now um, add my description create EPC JSON and hit commit to main. Okay, so now we can see that we no longer have what's called um, staged uh, changes or uh, changed files, sorry. But when we click on history, we can now see that we have initial commit, which is the creation of the repository. But we also have this thing called a new commit in our history. So now let's go back to our online copy of repo and hit refresh. And we might be wondering, where is our commit? We can see there's only one commit here, which is the same one that we saw on uh, the GitHub desktop initial commit, but our new file is not present there. And that is because with GitHub, we shouldn't simply commit something, which means that I'm willing to commit this file to the history of my repository, but we also need to do something called pushing it. So when we press the button here that says push to origin, we can now see that it is in the process of pushing it to the online version of your repository. So when we go back here and hit refresh, now we can see that we have two commits and our newly created file is present on this online server. So that's great. We've now created a GitHub repository. We've added some files. We've learned about uh, making changes and uh, done some more cool stuff with it. Okay. The next thing that I'd like to do is uh, first create a, a hip file. So I'm just going to create a box here. All right, just like that. And we're going to save our box in the repo. So I'm going back to the EPC01. I'm going to create a new folder called hip. That's the same name I always use. And I'm just going to say test file underscore zero one. Hit accept. And now when we go back to GitHub, we will see that indeed we have this test file zero one dot hip. So we can say uh, created test file 01, hit commit and uh, push it to the internet. And now we have a copy of that hip file online. Now, let's say when we add a sphere, we add a sphere to this here. Let's just make the sphere visible and then hit save again. Now, when we go back to uh, GitHub, we'll notice that now we have two files. We can see that the test file 01 has been modified but we've also gotten this new file, which is this backup file that Houdini creates. And when we use version control, right, or source control or any other application to manage versions of our files, we do not need to use backup files because whenever we want to go back to an older version of a file, we can simply return to an older commit of that same file. So this is where I'd like to introduce the concept of a git ignore file. Git ignore file allows you to specify files or directories or a series of files that GitHub should not worry about, files it should not be tracking in its history. So I'm going to simply right click and say um, ignore file, add to dot git ignore. And now what we'll see is that it has created a new file called dot git ignore, which when we open it, let's just open it real quick, we can see that it has added our backup um, file or the hip file in here. Right. If, however, we were to save another version, right, let's just hit save again, which means that Houdini is going to create another backup file, we can see that it has added another backup file here. So we can once again go in here and say ignore file, and it is going to be adding this 
here as well. But this is, you know, not convenient because now we need to do this every single time when we hit save, which is, you know, defeating the purpose. So what you can do as well is simply only point it at a folder, in this case, hip slash backup. And what we'll see is that now it is ignoring everything that is part of this folder. You can also make use of git ignores to, for example, um, ignore any PNG files if you wanted to do so uh, using the star and then your um, um, file extension uh, like that. Uh, but for now, we're just simply worried about, you know, the backup files for GitHub. So once again, I'm going to say uh, created git ignore and then commit it to main and then simply push it to main. Great, so now we've done a couple of different concepts on GitHub. We've created a git ignore, we have added a hip file, we have added our JSON, we've learned about um, committing, we've learned about pushing, uh, which means that now you should be pretty good um, creating files and uploading those to GitHub. All right, next chapter, creating custom Python modules. So, um, you know, if you're a pipeline TD in Houdini, you've probably used some Python already. Uh, perhaps you've not written it yourself, you've copied it from elsewhere and simply run it. Perhaps you've gotten a script from someone else that they've given to you and you simply run it as well. Or perhaps, you know, you're experienced and you've written lots of pipeline uh, code yourself or Python code. Um, you can do lots of stuff with it, right? You can um, create nodes, you can set parameters on nodes. Uh, you can create interactive viewer states, you can manipulate environments, you can create geometry. Um, but in general, you know, you can write lots and lots and lots of Python code. Um, let's take a look at Houdini and just take a look at a couple of different places where you can put that code. Um, you can, for example, create a Python node here where you can execute Python code. Uh, we can create a um, new shelf tool where we can write Python code. We can put it in the... Um, uh, session module of Houdini. We can put it inside HDAs, we can put it in a viewer state, we can put it uh, in callbacks outside of Houdini that Houdini runs when it does things. We can put it in a post or pre-frame script. So as you can see, lots of places to put code. But that of course is nice because you can do lots of things you want with it in any way you want. But it also introduces some problems because let's say you have some code that you keep reusing uh, which means that now you need to keep copying your changes to all these various locations where you use that code. And that, of course, is highly impractical because you need to, first of all, keep track of where your code lives and also highly prone to errors. So this is where Python modules come in. Uh, we can simply create a file on disk that stores our Python code and then load that Python code where we actually want it to be used. So let's try and do that. Let's create our very first own module. Now, the first thing that I'm going to do is um, simply write some Python code so that at least we've seen some Python code that we want to use. All right, so in here, uh, I'm going to make a new function called um, test. And what test is going to do is it's simply going to print. It's going to print something. And what is it going to print? Hello, it seems to work like that. Okay, now when we run the function test and we have the Python sub cook, we should now be seeing that uh, it does indeed print hello, it seems to work. Now, let's say we want to use this code elsewhere, for example, in that shelf tool that we created. Let's just put it there and then hit apply and then cook this node. You can see that it is indeed printing the same thing. Now, let's say we wanted to say hello, it uh, seems to work. Have a nice day, like that. And we cook our Python SOP. We can see that it says, hello, it seems to work. Have a nice day. But when we execute our shelf tool, it still says, hello, it seems to work, but it doesn't say, have a nice day. And this is exactly the problem that we're gonna solve with Python modules, okay? So create a new file. And in here, we're going to be copying this uh, function, right, that we defined, the test one. So there, let's just put it in there. And then what we're gonna be doing is saving it inside of our package that we created earlier. And where do we put this Python module? Now, Houdini has a couple of different locations where it expects these to be found. It can be stored inside Houdini path python x.y libs, you know, replace the x and the y with the version number of Houdini. We can put it in Houdini path slash script slash Python. 
Uh, we can put it in Houdini user pref there slash script slash Python, which also means that we can put it in our package in a folder called slash script slash Python. So let's try and save it there. Let's create a new folder. We're going to call it scripts, right? Let's match what we saw there in our document. And then in here, we're going to create a folder called Python. And in here, we're going to say EPC underscore module dot pi. Now you can name this whatever it is you want to name it. Um, but for now, we just call it EPC module. Let's hit save there. And now we can see Sublime has all also automatically added to the um, proper uh, coloring for Python because it knows that it's a Python file. And now when we want to load this in Houdini, we of course first need to restart Houdini. So let's do that. Okay, so it has reboot. Now when we create our Python SOP, we can say import EPC module and hit enter. And now what we can do is we can say EPC underscore module dot test, right? We're calling that test function from the EPC module. And now when we open up our console, we should indeed see that it is running that Python code. So two benefits to this. Now, when we put this code in our shelf tool, right, like that, hit apply and accept, this shelf tool will run the exact same code that it is running here, right? Because it is simply running the code inside of this Python module. So now when we make changes here, for example, add a smiley, and we were to restart Houdini and we were to run this tool and this tool, both will result in the same output in our console because now it is simply calling code found here, right? Pointing to this exact code rather than having the code part of your node here. So that's pretty cool. And we'll be using it later on to do various things with it. Okay, so now of course that we have created a new Python file, we of course need to add it to GitHub. Now, when you create Python and you run Python in Houdini, you can see that it is creating this .pyc file. Now, we don't want this .pyc file because it is a generated file, all right, whenever Houdini executes Python or the Python interpreter runs Python. So what we can do is in our git ignore add star .pyc. And then when we hit save and go back to GitHub, we can see that now no longer does it show those compiled files. So what we can say now is added EPC module.py. Let's commit that to main. Let's push it. And there we go. It is now part of the history of our repository, meaning that we can go back to an older version on it anytime when we make a commit. Okay, great. So now let's say that uh, you know you're working in a larger studio and you've created modules. Right? You've created uh, some more than uh, simply a module called uh, EPC module, um, what you'll come across at some point is that someone else is also going to make a module named the exact same thing. Perhaps not when you call it EPC underscore module, but let's say you call it studio helpers or studio tools or whatever else like that. Someone else may actually also create that module. Because remember, like I said earlier in the video, Houdini is a deck of cards, your package is a set of cards, when these all get shuffled together, all the files get put in the same folder. And what may happen then is a clashing of your package with someone else's package because you've got modules named the exact same thing. So what we can do is make use of something called namespacing that we can see here, which is simply similar to a namespacing of HDAs in Houdini, but then for code. So instead of having our Python file live like this, we can put it in a folder, for example, called um, EPC, like that. And then we can put our module in there, like that. Now let's restart Houdini and uh, run that same code that we saw before and see if it still works. Okay, so there we go, we have Houdini back up. Let's put our Python soft there again. And uh, let's do import EPC underscore module. 
and we're gonna see that it says, hey, no module named EPC module. But when we look at our package, we can see that it is called EPC module. So why is it not there? Well, that is because we just added it in a folder or uh, namespace, okay? So what we can do is instead of saying import EPC module, we also need to say that it is part of the EPC namespace. So let's do from EPC import EPC module. And now we can see that it once again works. Now to make this a bit more convenient to use, we can say from EPC import EPC module as um, let's just call it EPCM. EPCM. So now when we want to run stuff from the EPC module, we can simply type EPCM dot test like we saw earlier. And now we can run the exact same code again. Okay. So this is just a little tip that you should be using for your um, plugins or your modules. What I would recommend is the namespace that you use, right? This folder name here in your Python folder for your package, simply name it perhaps the name of your uh, plugin, because then when someone reads the code, they can also immediately see that, hey, import uh, this from this namespace, ah, it's from that plugin, right? That just makes it easier for people to work with your uh, files. Okay, and that's it for creating custom Python modules. Continuing with extending menus in Houdini. So this is where some of the fun begins to start, right? Of course, the other things that we've done are also fun, but this, in my opinion, is, you know, even more fun. So when you've used Houdini um, and you use the UI, right? How can you get around the UI? Uh, when you look at it closer under the microscope and you look at what's under the hood, right? Under what you see here, you'll actually realize that all of Houdini or most of Houdini is actually constructed and defined as XML files that um, tell Houdini how things are loaded, what is part of, for example, a right-click menu, what is part of, for example, the timeline when you um, right-click on it, and what happens when you click one of these buttons. That is actually all XML files doing things. Now, these XML files, they live in, of course, Houdini's install directory, right? The uh, HFS folder that we saw earlier on. So let's go there. Let's go to the um, side effects software folder. Let's open up one of the builds, go into the Houdini folder, and we'll see that we have uh, XML. We can see that we have animation editor menu.xml. We can see that we have channel list menu.xml. We can see that we have main menu.xml. We can see that we have uh, parm menu.xml. So let's open one of these real quick and take a look at what's inside. So you can see that we have um, a thing called channels menu. We can see that we have um, some reference menu things here, scene data, uh, lots of cool stuff that, you know, you may want to hook into or modify or do things with. As you can see here, here it has some of these uh, effects that you see, right? Like the hold, cycle, extend, slope, cycle, oscillate. You know, these are all things that you can find in the right-click menu when you go under channels, right? This also means that we can modify these things, but it also means that we can create these things. So it's really, really powerful uh, being able to modify all these files with Houdini once again, because of Houdini being that deck of cards with um, cards that you can shuffle into it as plugins. So some of the more common ones we can actually see here, the uh, Parm menu, the Play Bar menu, the Shelf menu, the Op menu.xml. The one that I'm going to be looking at because it's relevant to um, this session is the Parm menu.xml, which allows you to modify what is there when you right click on a parameter. Okay. Being able to use these files, right, or these XML files, uh, it also allows you to immediately tie these to a hotkey. And the way it works is you can see it has this h.pain.parms. And then, of course, the name of the tool. These are actually also the IDs um, that are part of the hotkey editor in Houdini. So when you construct your own um, items in an XML file, you can also automatically tie these to a hotkey that you've created in the hotkey editor. Okay, so really convenient. Now, 
Let's try and create um, some of these ourselves. First of all, go back to your uh, text editor and create a new file. And to create an XML file that Houdini understands for your code, this is the bare minimum that you're gonna need to put in there. So I'm gonna just copy that, uh, but you can also just copy this from the documentation or simply type it over. Um, you can see that we're defining a menu document and then we define you know, menu open, menu close, and menu document. And this is just plain XML. If you're not familiar with XML, uh, you can go read up on XML if you really want to, but the things that you know we're gonna do with um, these menu files or XML files are really basic, so um, I will just follow along and it should be, should be fine for you. Okay, so where do we save this? Let's save that first of all, and let's go to our package because we want this to be part of the uh, tool set that we are creating. The, the place you save these XML files is the same as where Houdini stores them, right? And as you can see, it simply stores them in the root of you know, the Houdini folder, which for us is our plugin root. Now, depending on the name of your XML file, it's going to be used for different purposes. And as you can see, the one we are interested in is the Parm menu. So we need to store it as Parm with uh, uppercase P-A-R-M and then menu lowercase dot XML. So let's save it as that. Let's just save it as parm menu.xml and hit save. And there we go. It is now saved as parm menu.xml in the root of our repository, which means that we should also be able to see it here. Great. Now, let's continue on. Let's create some of these menu items that we see. Menu items uh, can be created you know, as various things, we can um, create something called a script item, which is simply a button, right? One of these things here that executes some code when we press on it. Part of a script item can be a property called a label, which is the text that you see here, but can also be a label expression, which allows you to dynamically set the text. So one is static, right? Just hard coded. And one is dynamic. For example, if you have you know number of files on disk, you can also use the label expression to dynamically set the text. We're simply going to use label in this example because we're just going to create you know a button that you click to do something with. Um, but of course, it also needs to know what it is that it needs to execute when you press it. Now, for this, you can use two things. You can use script path, which is a path to a Python script on disk that should be run when the menu item is pressed, right? Similar to the um, Python script that we've written earlier, or we can actually embed the code in the XML item itself. Now, to be honest, I have never used script path. Um, I always use script code because it's just much more convenient than the script path option. Okay. We can also uh, create something called an action item. And an action item is simply invoking a built-in Houdini command. So if you already have, for example, one of those uh, hotkey items defined with h dot something, you can also just create an item called action item, put in the action item hotkey ID, and it's just going to execute that. Personally, I have also never used this. I once again also just prefer using a script item with some script code uh, that executes it. You can also add visual elements to your right-click menu. For example, this the bar that we see there, which is this separator item line here. We can also make use of a title item, which allows you to create a title, right? Like big text that describes what something is. And then underneath it, you can put your script items um, just to organize things and make it easier to read for your user. If you wanna put stuff in submenus, you can simply wrap it in an item or a property called submenu. Okay, so let's do that. Let's first create our own script item. And the way we're gonna do that is um, by replicating this code here. So as mentioned before, let's just start with a simple example, which is um, a button that you can click. So in our JSON, underneath or in between these two menu properties, we're going to create a new item called script item like that and then we're going to close that uh, sorry not close it yet we first need to type the id and the id in this case we're just going to call it h dot um, epc underscore test underscore zero one and then we're going to close it now when you open 
uh, a property like this for a script item, you also need to close it. So let's just add another one here and then we're gonna type slash and then script item. So now all the stuff that we're gonna put in between these two is part of that script item menu item. Now, what do we wanna add in there? The first thing of course that we wanna do is add a label because otherwise, you know, we're not gonna see anything for our script item. So I'm gonna type label like that. And then in between uh, the opening and the closing statement, we can write the actual text that we want it to show. So let's just call it EPC example underscore uh, zero one like that and just hit save. Now let's restart Houdini and check if our new menu item called EPC example underscore uh, sorry space zero one is present in our parameter menu. So let's create a geometry node and now when we click on a parameter we can indeed see that it is part of our uh, menu here but when we click it nothing is going to happen because we've only added a label and nothing else. So this is where we go back up to the portion where we can see what we can put in there. And what we can put in there is the script code. So let's just put script code in there. Go back to our menu. And we're going to put it in the same indentation level as the label. And now technically you don't need to do this, but it's just much better for organizational purposes because it is a nice way of seeing what is sort of grouped together, right? We can see that um, this script item is one entity of things that belong together and everything part of the script item is all this indented stuff. Now, we have open script code. So once again, of course, we also need to close script code and everything we put in there in between, um, we will be considering as part of script code. So let's put some Python code here. Let's type uh, print hello like that and hit save and um, close Houdini and restart Houdini. And now when we press that button, we should be seeing the word hello exclamation mark in our console. Okay, so let's create our node once again. So we have some parameters and then let's right click it and click on this button. And we can see that it says syntax errors detected. It says indentation error, unexpected indent. Now, you may be wondering, okay, that's a little bit weird um, because you know we're just indenting it here. Perhaps we run it like that and then restart Houdini and we'll actually notice that it is going to be producing the exact same um, issue, right? It's gonna say syntax error, this does not make sense. And the reason for that is when XML gets loaded, this gets parsed and then all of this code, which may have some special characters in here, for example, a slash or something else like that, it is going to think that it is XML code, but it is in fact not XML code because this is Python code. So how do we tell XML that all this stuff here is code that it should not do anything with? Don't format it, don't parse it. I just wanted to keep it as is. Now this is what we can make use of the C data property, okay? And so to make use of that, we can once again start with this opening bracket. We can put an exclamation mark. Then we add a square bracket open. We type C data, then another square bracket like that. And as you can see, you know, it already understands that we want to add uh, character data, like raw character data that we do not want to modify, or we don't want it to, to parse differently. Now let's close that with two square brackets and then the closing bracket like that. And now what we'll actually see is that this code here is formatted differently in terms of uh, linting here. So that's great. So now at least we know that um, the Sublime Text editor is happy with it. Now let's check if the Houdini editor is happy with it as well by restarting Houdini and pressing that button again. There we go. It has rebooted. Let's create some parameters. And now when we click it, we can see that once again, we get an indent error. All right, let's check that out. Let's see what's wrong here. Um, now let's just put it right there just to be sure. Now let's restart Houdini. Create another parameter there. Let's click it. And now as we can see, it says hello, okay? 
So perfect, we've learned how to properly um, create a menu item, script item to be specific. We've added a label, we've added some script code that is executed, and we have it working in Houdini. Now, as you can see, indentation in Python, very important. So just move this all the way to the left, make sure there's no spaces here after the square bracket, and uh, you should be good to go. Okay, now let's make it a bit more interesting. Now let's wrap this thing in a submenu. And the way we can do that is uh, using the submenu property, which we saw um, here, okay? So let's go back to our JSON or our XML, sorry. And then outside of this script item, we're going to be creating a submenu like that. We're going to give it an ID. So let's just call it uh, EPC null caps. Let's open it. And then after our script item, we're going to be closing, oops, autocomplete, submenu like that. And we can see that now we have uh, properly wrapped this in a submenu. Now, we have a submenu, but the submenu itself is also a property that needs a label, okay? So inside of the submenu, the very first thing that we'll have is a label. And we're going to be calling it EPC and then closing it with another label statement. Now, as you can see, if we don't indent this properly, it is going to get harder and harder to read, right? So I'm going to add a, an enter or some white space after our submenu. Then our label, we are going to keep there. Our script item, we're going to indent one level. Then the label of the script item itself, we're going to indent. The script code, we're going to indent. The closing of the script code and the script item, we're going to indent. So that now, once again, we can see that this is one property and our submenu is a level of its own, right? It's this level here. Now, this is a lot better to read already, but it can be better. In XML, you are able to add comments to your text, uh, JSON or uh, XML, sorry, by adding this uh, opening bracket, exclamation mark, two dashes, and then you can say uh, my script item and then closing it by doing the opposite. So dash, dash, and then a closing bracket. And we can just wrap that around our script code so that um, we can now see even better that this is one thing, okay? Let's close Houdini, restart it, and see if it now properly works. Okay, good to go. So let's create some parameters. And now we should be seeing a submenu called EPC with our script item EPC example, which prints hello when we click on it. Great, so now we have learned how to create XML files, how to use those for menus in Houdini for parameters in this case, you can use them for other purposes as well. Uh, but for now, parameters is sufficient for the thing that we're going to be working towards. All right, we have now arrived at the last chapter of this session, and that is integrating ChatGPT for VEX. So we're going to combine all these different things that we've learned. Uh, the plugin package, which is where all of our code is going to live. We are going to make use of that custom Python module that we've created. We're going to make use of the menu item that we've created. And we're going to make use of external Python modules. Now, you may be wondering, we did not cover this chapter in this video. And that is because the OpenAI uh, module, which is the one that we're going to be using from the API, is actually part of MLOps in Houdini. Okay. So if you do not have MLOps, please install it, follow the install instructions there, and then you can follow along nicely here. If you um, do not have MLOps, uh, you can simply install the MLOps or the uh, OpenAI module in Python, and you should be good to go as well. Okay, so what is it that we're going to be doing? We want to be able to drop down a wrangle and right click on the, on the expression and simply say, um, you know, generate my script, the same way that um, we can do it in the MLOps functionality here. But we're gonna learn how to write that functionality ourselves. Okay, so the very first thing that we're gonna do is understand what the OpenAI API allows us to do. So we can make use of this thing called chat completion. And chat completion 
allows you to write a prompt the same way that you can do on the chat GPT, you know, website when you use the chat function, and it is going to give you a reply. Now we can make use of this chat completion to, for example, give ChatGPT an instruction and ChatGPT will give us back the code that we wanted to write. So to make use of the API, the first thing that we're gonna do is simply say import OpenAI, okay? Now, when you cook your Python code, uh, this should not throw any errors saying module not found. If that is the case, you probably did not install MLOps or you did not install the OpenAI API, okay? So make sure you do that first before you continue. All right, the next thing that we're gonna do is um, simply use the example snippet that the ChatGPT documentation has uh, for using it. So we're going to be using, importing the OS, we're going to import OpenAI, we're going to set the API key, right? Which is the key that uh, we're gonna to use to um, tie this command to our account. Now, it is of course important that you have set your OpenAI API key in MLOps. Uh, if not, then you can just set the, it to be a string here. And then we're going to create a chat completion object and call the create function in it, right? Or the method rather. We're gonna pass in a couple of arguments. What is the model that we wanna use? And what are the messages that we wanna pass in? The temperature and N. Now we're gonna go over these in a little bit, what these actually mean. But for now, what I'm gonna do is simply copy this code here and inside of Houdini, simply paste it, okay? So when we hit uh, cook here, we can see that it is actually printing a ton of stuff here. So let's look at this code once again after we clean it up a little bit. There, there we go. Let's see, so it returns this thing and that is happening because it's calling this print uh, statement on the completion, right? Which is this variable that we created earlier. Now, what is it that we're actually doing? It gives us back a, a dictionary or a JSON-like structure that um, contains a bunch of stuff that ChatGPT tells us. It first of all tells us um, choices. Now, choices is a key containing a list of responses that ChatGPT has created, okay? Each one of these responses has a finish reason. Why did it you know, finish the conversation, so to speak? Well, in this case, it simply stopped because we just asked it to do chat completion. We don't want to hold a conversation. We just wanted to complete a chat, right? Chat completion. Index is simply the index of the answer and the message itself is the actual reply of ChatGPT. So if you were to use this on the internet, on the website, it would do the exact same thing, but the only thing you would see as a user is this reply. It says, hi there, how can I assist you today? Of course, it doesn't make sense because it's chat completion, but it did indeed complete the chat by properly replying to our uh, quote. Then of course here we have some other metadata that we can look at, but it's not really relevant for our purpose here. So, however, what is relevant for us or under to understand is the code that we're actually calling here. Now, the model that we're using is simply, you know, which weight of the ChatGPT model are we calling onto? And most importantly, what is the message that we want to pass on to ChatGPT? In this case, our message was hello, which makes sense because the reply was, hi there, how can I help you today? So if we change this to be, um, what do you know about side effects Houdini? Question mark. And then cook the node. Hopefully we get a reply uh, from ChatGPT, you know, informing us a little bit about what it knows about side effects Houdini. Looks like it's still cooking. And of course, depending on how busy the, uh, the uh, server is, it's gonna take longer or less long. And as you can see, in this case, it, it replies a bunch of information about what it knows about Houdini. It says side effects Houdini is a powerful 3D animation, visual effects software developed by side effects, and then yada, yada, yada. Lots of stuff that, you know, as Houdini users, we already know about. But as you can see, this is really powerful because now we're able to use the thing that we first had in a browser from within Houdini. 
Even cooler is we can do this from within Python, meaning that we can, like we saw earlier in this session, we can put this anywhere in Houdini. We can put this in a shelf button. We can put this in a right click menu. We can put this wherever we want. And that is what we will actually be doing because as I said earlier, we want ChatGPT to be writing some VEX code for us. So where do we go next now that we know, you know how to call onto ChatGPT? Okay, so to write this code, first of all, what we're gonna do is not put it in here because once again, this would mean that we'd have to move it to various places when we call onto it. We are going to be putting it in the EPC module instead. So let's just open the actual properly namespace module so that we make sure that we are in the right one. And then we're going to paste this code that we see here, right? The same one that we just executed. Great. Now, whenever this module gets loaded, this code gets executed, which is not what we want. So what we're gonna be doing instead is we're gonna be creating a function. Let's just call it um, um, generate vex code, like that. Now, I want it to be able to take in two arguments. I wanted to take in a wrapper and I wanted to take in a prompt. And the reason I have a wrapper and a prompt is um, because of the following. I want to be able to reuse this code with different instructions. Sometimes I wanted to generate new VEX code, while other times I wanted to um, document my VEX code. Okay? And the wrapper is basically the instruction. For the generating VEX code, I'm going to tell it, generate me new VEX code, here is the prompt. If I wanted to document the VEX code, I want a wrapper to be, here is some VEX code, please document it. Okay, so this simply allows me to reuse this code, uh, which is a bit cleaner. Now, where do we put the wrapper and the prompt? Of course, we're going to put it right here in the content because this is what we're gonna be sending to ChatGPT. So let's make an F string. An F string is simply a string that has been formatted using variables that uh, Python knows about. And we can do that by simply typing these um, curly brackets where we can put you know, some Python code in there. In this case, wrapper, and then do a spacebar, and then we're going to type prompt, just like that. Okay, so let's hit um, save, like that, and fix our um, indentation levels. So of course, because we've created a function, this needs to be uh, indented inside of the body of the VEX of the uh, Python code. And then of course, the other thing that we need to do is when we look at the uh, completion object that gets printed by um, ChatGPT reply, we don't want it to reply all of the stuff in the metadata and the whatever else. We simply want it to reply or return the value of the response, right? So let's just wait for that to complete. We can see that um, we have uh, an object, right? Which is this thing here, it's this dictionary object. And then inside of it, we have this key called choices. So when we say completion.choices, dot, and then we want to grab the uh, message. And then um, we want to grab the uh, content from it, right? So similar to what we see here. Uh, oops, sorry, I forgot one thing. Of course, we don't simply want to grab choices. We, of course, need to specify which index of the choices we want to grab. In this case, the first one, right? Index zero. And then we're going to grab the message property, right? Which is this one here. And inside of the message property, we want to grab the content property, which is returning us this string here, okay? So let's just do that. Go back to Dini. I'm going to say message sorry, content.message, content.message. Okay, let's verify that now we get properly what we want. So let's just execute this Python code here. And it is still cooking. We're waiting for the OpenAI server to respond to us. And of course, the more complex your prompt is, the longer this is going to take. So in this case, uh, yeah, 
the reply is quite long, um, so it takes a while for it to return it. Oh, and we get an error. Let's see what the error is. Attribute content. Did I mess it up? Let's check. Message.content. Great. I have put them the wrong way around. So I'm going to say message dot content, which also makes sense, right? Because message has content and not the content has message. And this once again is taking its sweet time. And there we go. Now the reply that we get is just the text, as you can see here. Uh, and no longer all of the metadata. So great, if we were to ask it some VEX code now, it would only return us some VEX code. So now that we know how to query just the property that we actually want, we are going to be returning that thing from our function, right? We're going to say com return completion.choices message.content and save it like that. And so now when we call this code or this uh, function from our um, module, it should be giving us reply to our wrapper and our prompt. Great. So now that we have that, how do we actually tie this into our um, XML code, right? How do we make this work with our uh, button that we can click? Okay, so let's go back to our XML code. And what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna add a new script item. So let's create a copy of this what we had before just like that and let's just call it EPC test 02 we're going to say EPC example vex and then for our script code we actually want to execute some code right first thing that we're going to do is we are going to import our module let's verify the location of our module real quick let's go to EPC 01 scripts Python it is in the EPC namespace and then EPC module. So let's do that. We're going to put this on a new line. We're going to say from EPC import EPC module. And then we're going to say as EPCM, right? Because it's a bit easier to work with. Great. Next up, what we want to do is we want to call that function that we created. Right, which is this one here, generate vec code with two arguments, the wrapper and the prompt. So let's put that in there. We're gonna say EPCM, right? Because we're calling it from this module. Then we're gonna say dot and then the name of our function and then our wrapper and our prompt. Now, let's just define those. Wrapper equals, and then we're gonna put some stuff here. And a prompt equals, and we're gonna put some stuff here. Now, for the wrapper, we of course need to give it an instruction of what we wanted to actually do. So in this case, we're going to say, um, I want you to generate effects, um, sorry, side effects, Houdini vex code, and only return the code to me without any explanation. Okay, here is what I want you to generate. Just like that, okay. Now for a prompt, let's just say um, generate some random vertex colors for each point, just like that, okay. So now when we call uh, generate fix code from our uh, module with the wrapper argument as well as the prompt argument, what happens is it's going to add these two together, right? The wrapper is going to say, I want you to generate the vex code, yada, yada, yada. Here's what I want you to generate. Generate some random vertex colors for each point. Now, if we go back to our module, we can see that we are sending to ChatGPT first our instruction, which is generate me vex code, don't give me any explanations. And then what we wanted to generate, and then what we get back, hopefully, is just the VEX code, okay? So to verify that, uh, of course, what we're going to be doing is we're going to store the result in a variable. We're going to say result equals. 
and then we're going to say print result like that. Hit save and we should be good to go. So let's close Houdini and restart it because we've made changes to both our uh, Python code as well as our XML file. But now when we've booted up Houdini and we right click on a parameter, hopefully we're gonna actually see what we wanted it to do. So I'm gonna create a geometry node. I'm going to create a wrangle. And now when we right click here and we click on EPC example vex, uh, of course, it is going to take some time once again to generate some stuff. Uh, and as we can see here, now it properly prints some VEX code. Uh, it says generate random vertex calls for each point, and then it generates some code here, and then the actual, you know, logic here. It's of course a bit weird, this for loop, but you know, it does what it asked. Okay, so now that we have that, um, it's cool, but it's not quite you know, very useful yet, right? Because we've, we've both hard coded our wrapper, the instruction, and our prompt. Uh, of course, you know, the, uh, the prompt, we'd want to be different, right? We want it to be something useful. So how about um, us being able to write some VEX code here? V at CD equals rand, and then we're just going to say at P. How about we have a ChatGPT add documentation to this or just explain the code? Now, to do that, um, we of course need to modify our wrapper. So I want you to generate side effects with any VEX code and only return the code to me without an explanation. Here is some code I want you to explain with added comments. Great, so instead of it generating code, we now want it to add comments. Now for the prompt, we don't want it to be, you know, this here, we want it to be the VEX code that we have in a parameter. Now, how do we get the actual value from the parameter? Now to do that, we can make use of quarks. Quarks are basically just a dictionary that contains information relevant to the current action that you're doing. So like we see here in the, um, the document that we've created earlier, or that we're working with as reference, we can see that there is a property called parms in there, which is referring to the parameter that we are right clicking on, right? So this quarks property is how we interface between our action that is happening in Houdini and the code that we're executing here. So to grab the parameter, we can simply type parms like that, which is going to give us all the parameters that we're currently right clicking on. You may be wondering, we're only right clicking on one parameter at a time, but that is actually not true because what happens if you right click on a tuple like this, we have an X parameter, a Y parameter and a Z parameter, which may all be returned when we click on the scale parameter here. So in our case, since we know that we're only gonna be dealing with wrangles, we're just going to grab the first index from that list, right? So we're gonna say zero which is going to be our parm. So we're going to say parm equals that. Okay, now how do we grab the value from our parameter? We're going to say um, value equals, and then we're going to say parm dot um, eval as string. Now you've probably used this already. Uh, what this is going to do is it's going to evaluate this parameter and give us the evaluated, evaluated um, value as a string. Now in our case, since we are working with code and we want it to modify the actual raw code itself, we're not gonna be using eval as string. Instead, we're gonna be using another one called raw value, which is going to grab, as described here, the actual raw value of the parameter. Because let's say if we added some backticks here with an expression, like that, these would be evaluated. And we don't want that because we want ChatGPT to understand the actual code that we've written ourselves. So we're going to grab the raw value. Now, in this case, uh, we now have the value of our results. So we're going to say prompt equals generate some random footage calls for each point. And the result is going to be when we call this function with the wrapper as well as the prompt. Now, the prompt is now no longer going to be this string of text here. The prompt is going to be the value of the VEX code. 
right? So what is the stuff that is part of that parameter? So we can say prompt equals value, or of course, if you wanna be a little bit cleaner, you can just also directly pass value in here. Now let's hit save there. Let's close Houdini and restart it. And let's see if we get ChatGPT to print the now documented um, copy of our VEX code in the console. So let's create a geometry node and let's create a wrangle. And we're going to say v at p equals rand at p. Oh, of course, we should not be doing position, we should be doing color. Uh, and now when we click this button, hopefully our prompt is going to say, ah, there you go, generate a random color for each point in space. And then there we go, it is properly populated like that. Now, all cool. However, we don't want it to simply print it, we want it to set the parameter value to be that. Now, to do that, replace the print with parm.set. And then what are we going to set it to? We're going to set it to the result, which means that now hopefully, when we run our code, it should just immediately set the parameter of the wrangle instead of printing the thing. So let's do that. Let's do another wrangle node. And we're going to say v at cd equals rand at v like that. There you go. And now when we run our code, hopefully it is going to automatically replace this with a documented version of our code. Oh, it seems like it did not like doing that. So let's try that again. There you go. It has added a comment describing generate a random color value for each point position. There you go. We have now combined all the knowledge that we've learned throughout this session to um, create a tool that allows us to right click on a wrangle in the parameter, sorry, uh, click on an XML item and execute some code. And all of that stuff is stored in a plugin package uploaded on GitHub. That's it for this uh, session. Um, there is more uh, to read about in um, the document. This will also be um, part of a larger course, which I'll be releasing in the future uh, for pipeline TDs in Houdini. But for now, enjoy the gained knowledge and good luck.